Ethan, there's no time for a witty opening. We have so much to talk about today. We just got to dive right into it. Let's do it. All right, everybody, welcome back to Brian and Ethan's Biathlon Podcast. Uh, well, yeah, welcome back. Um, I think when we left off after World Champs, there was some confusion as to whether or not, I guess not confusion, but, um, you know, just some question as to whether or not we we're going to be able to record in Kazakhstan or while I was in Kazakhstan. And unfortunately, just with time changes, poor internet, me, just my schedule being absolutely loaded, we weren't able to chat after... Um, after Nova Mesto and Oosterson, unfortunately. But uh, Ethan, I'm sure you probably watched the races from those two places. How were they? They were they were a little interesting. Some people were out with COVID. Uh, I think some people were just gassed from world champs, but they were still great races. Yeah, but everyone, at least most everyone, only like Jacqueline missed home and colon at the end of the season. Um, but we're going to dive right into our season ending podcast because there's so much to talk about. And normally I don't do this, but today we will be talking about obviously the overall winners. There was a big shakeup in the French coaching staff. Um, some, some interesting news to talk about there. Um, obviously so many retirements on the women's side specifically, uh, and then an incredible battle for the blue bib. And then we'll end on some uh, talking about how our fantasy picks went. And then our spare round today will be who's going to be the overall winner next year. But um, I'm just basically I'm just giving you the uh, the heads up now, listener, that this is going to be a long episode. And if it goes too long, we might break this into you know part one and part two. So if you're listening to this and suddenly towards the middle of the conversation, we just sort of say, all right, that's it. We're moving on to the next one. Uh, it's because we're going to break this into two parts. But we don't know yet because we're just starting. So uh, on that note, why don't we just dive right into that first hit, Ethan? Overall winners. Like, let's start with Johannes Tingas bow. I know everyone's probably tired of talking about him, but you can't deny his season. Like, Mm-hmm. Absolutely historic season for Johannes Tingas Bo. It was it was incredible to watch the whole year. You know, he, he just kept winning, making the podium every single race. And <clears throat> yeah, you could have gotten tired of it, but it was just so exciting to see the level that he was at compared to everyone else every single day. It was almost unbelievable every single race. And, you know, he won by almost over 400 points and that's with him missing a few races in there too. And yeah, I don't know what more to say other than it was truly incredible. Yeah. And I mean, he, it's, it's, he set, or I'm sorry. Yes. He set a record for most wins in the season, breaking his own record of 16 wins. He earned 19 wins this year and he missed, like you said, a couple of races due to COVID Mm-hmm. Um, and then he tied Martin Forcade for most podiums in a season with 22, I believe it was. And Forcade mm-hmm. did that feat twice. And, uh, and Bo was able to do that this year as well. So mm-hmm. just all the way around, like no matter how much you got bored or were tired of hearing about Johannes Tingas Bo, like all the way around, this was an absolutely elite season could it be the best of the best that we've ever seen i think it might be i i was thinking it might be too i might have to go back and look at some some previous years but at least in my time of watching biathlon there was martin mm-hmm. for cod but i don't know if for cod was as separated from the rest of the field as johannes tingus bow was this year mm-hmm. yeah and I'm just trying to look up right now, kind of in the background, I'm trying to pull up some, some data here, but I think just in terms of like overall, like performance as well, I think this is also among the most dominant performances we've ever seen. Let's see here. Um, and, and really, I think that's how Johannes Bo did this. And you mentioned this earlier is like his skiing, 
was just so far ahead of everyone else. Like even days where he didn't have the best shooting, his skiing was still just like head and shoulders above <laughs> everyone else that he could just, you know, I'll just pick it up a little bit on the tracks and, uh, <laughs> and yeah. I'll just, you know, come in, come in strong. But, um, I mean, we can't also overlook his shooting. He shot 90% this year, which is way above uh, what most people in the World Cup are doing. His prone was 93% about. Just absolutely incredible. And skiing 2% faster than the top 10. I just, I'm sorry. I'm just going through the stats right now. It's like, (laughs) this is absolutely incredible. Just yeah, when you see it on paper all laid out like this. Mm -hmm. One stat that jumps out to me is, uh, in terms of comparing him to Martin Fourcade, Martin Fourcade's highest average place for the whole season in race results was 2.2 in 2016-17. So he averaged essentially second place for the whole season. And this year, Johannes Singespo averaged 1.7. And Jeez. that's just incredible to me that he was... Essentially, if he wasn't first, he was second or third. Like he didn't really have any bad races where he finished way off the back. And I remember there are some races where Forcad, I think towards at least towards the end of his career, he wasn't. He it was like the in Russia he didn't make the pursuit or something, and then he just didn't do the mass start at the end, and like that was the end of the season. Everyone was kind of like, "What is going on?" But Johannes Ingesbode never had any like bad races this year. Right. And I mean, I, arguably you could say that his worst race of the season was the first race of the season where he came in like, what, like 15th or something like the mm-hmm. first individual, um, mm-hmm. uh, 12th, he came in 12th and he shot 80% and skied really fast <laughs> still <laughs> came in 12 and then from there on it was just every single race was on the podium and you could also even argue that his mass start i mean he came in third in honestly in the mass start but he you know that's the whole ski situation he kind of got gypped there and then you could say that his worst race was in oberhof in the mass start where Ponsaloma and samuelson just beat him you know mm-hmm. he had 85 percent shooting not his best shooting of the season and those guys shot 90 and 100 percent, and they just straight up beat him um but yeah it's just it's just absolutely incredible um i'm i'm curious and kind of the reason why i i put this question mark in our notes here was so he missed a couple races due to covid and then he had bad luck in NSA where he was still on the podium, but came in third twice where he was at his absolute prime. Like, I think he probably should have won both those races. Do you think because of even this stuff holding him back, like, I don't even know what the question I'm trying to ask is though. Like (laughs) even with this stuff holding him back, he was still able to have what we would consider the most dominant season of all time. Like, could you imagine a world where he didn't have, he didn't miss some time due to COVID. He didn't miss those, uh, those, or he didn't have those bad races due to the, the snow situation. Like he could have, he probably could have won, or it, I mean, at least podiumed every single race, except for that first one, but he raced 19 out of 21 races he probably could have gone 20 wins in 21 races had he, you know, not had the stuff that's completely out of his control happen to him. Mm-hmm. I I totally agree. I think that would have totally been achievable for him. And, you know, that sort of stuff happens. Like, you can't control getting sick and COVID. And you definitely can't control the snow conditions. And, you know, everyone had that problem, although some some athletes that are on Fisher more so than others in Le Grand Bonap. But... I think maybe if he stays healthy all of next year, we could see another another year like this, if not even better in terms of wins throughout the season. 
Mm -hmm. So he finished, he won the small globe for sprint. He won the small globe for the pursuit, came in second in the mass start ranking and seventh in the individual score. Does that tarnish this season at all? Considering in 2018, 19, he won every single globe. Martin Forcad, I think there's been multiple seasons where he's won every single globe. Does his inability to sweep the globes tarnish this immaculate season, do you think? I I don't think so. I mean, maybe a little bit on paper. You know, looking at it, he was seventh in the individual, but he only did two of the three. And second in the mass start, missed out on one of the mass starts. I think had he raced the full season, he definitely may, might have won the mass start. But I guess in terms of being an all-around biathlete and having an all-around season, maybe that edge goes to Forcada a little bit on paper, looking at the numbers here. And in, compared to his you know, 18-19 season where he swept all the globes. But I don't know, something about watching him this year just felt like he was on another level from everyone else and everyone or anyone that I've seen racing at least. I think a lot of people would be comparing this dominant season to probably for Cod's 2016, 17 season. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's the year that he had 22 podiums, a bunch of wins. And in that season, 16, 17, yeah. For Cod swept the globe chase. Um, won all the globes, had all those podiums, had all those uh, those wins. But yeah, Bo had way more wins this season than Forcott had in that season, and they tied for podiums. I mean, how did how did Forcott do at World Champs that year? He came away with one gold medal, two bronze, and some silvers in the relay, whereas this year. Johannes just got gold, 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 golds in the relays, silver in the men's relay, and then bronze in the mass start. So, yeah, I mean, scholars, biathlon scholars, maybe that's you and I. We will be having this conversation for years to come as to whether or not Mm -hmm. this was the greatest season of all time. I think it is. I mean, I agree with you. Just watching him ski like – Forcad was dominant, but there was never a time where you were like, it's almost like a guarantee. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's kind of what it felt like for me this year. It almost felt like a guarantee, like, oh, yeah, Mm -hmm. Bo's going to win this one. And then when he doesn't, it's like a surprise. Whereas like for me and Forcad, it was never like a guarantee that he Mm -hmm. was going to win it. And but it would always just be like, oh, but he's on the podium again. He's, you know, winning again. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's interesting. Yeah. It's uh, I, it's really fascinating. And and like I said, I I was totally on team. Like, oh, this is really boring. Like, you know, he's just gonna win every race. Everyone's fighting for second. But then, like after the like first three World Cup weekends, I was just like, you know what? We're witnessing history here. I want to see this guy win it out. Mm-hmm. I want to see this guy absolutely obliterate the competition and see just how high he can go. You know, how mm-hmm. dominant can he be? <laughs> And unfortunately, mm-hmm. there were just things out of his control that held him back a little bit. But no, for sure. Super exciting. Mm-hmm. I think, too, I never felt like Forcad could win a sprint with one or two misses. Like if Johannes Singespo still has one miss in a sprint, it's still pretty guaranteed that he's going to win. Even if Ligrate or Christensen were to shoot clean. But I never felt that with Forcad. I think Forcad might have been more consistent throughout his career, but I don't know if he ever quite had a season like Johannes Tingisbo this year. Yeah, I agree. And it's funny because Oleander Bjornadalen was saying like he would love to see Bo race in a cross country ski race just to see how he would stack up against, you know, his competition, uh, the cross country competition. And Forcott actually did that one year in his prime. I think he came in like 20th or something like that on the fifth world cup. 
I would love to see Bo jump into a, a, a cross country 10 K skate or something like that. And just see, cause I bet he's, I bet he's top 10. Do you think he's on the podium? <laughs> oh, I don't know if he's on the podium, but I would for sure put my money on him being top 10. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's flip it to the other side here. Same shot, though. No, we're not going to a different shot. We got Julia Simone, who did you see her winning the overall this year? Because I definitely didn't. <laughs> I, as well, definitely did not. And I think throughout the whole year, we kind of said we were just waiting for someone else to step it up and take that, uh, that yellow bib. But she held on to it the whole year. Yeah. And I, I think she, she's one who actually got a little bit lucky, I think from COVID. Um, obviously Elvira was, you know, uh, pretty competitive with her leading into world championships. And then, um, obviously Elvira missed some time in world champs because of COVID and obviously the, the world championship points don't count. I guess there's no points at world champs. So it's not like her missing races at world champs is what was the difference. But ever since Elvira missed some time, she just was flat. Like she didn't seem uh, that competitive anymore. And you can also, when you look at the overall score, like Elvira uh, going into world champs, I think was only a couple, like about a hundred points back. And then pretty much from world champs through the rest of the season, she barely scored any more points and just plummeted in the overall Doro passed her, Denise passed her, uh, Lisa Batozzi passed her. So there was that competition that, Julia got, you know, a little bit lucky uh, that, you know, no, you don't want anyone to get, you don't want to hope that someone gets sick, but Elvira caught COVID and then just kind of came up flat after that. And then uh, you have the, uh, you know, the Vitozzi doro battle, but those two, unfortunately, were just a little bit too inconsistent all season and could never really uh, keep pace with, with uh, Julia. I mean, Lisa Vitozzi started out really slow um, to start the season and then even Denise Herman, she kind of cooled down uh, halfway through the season, picked it up towards the end. But um, yeah, and then suddenly after, you know, Marta doesn't race the entire season, uh, Elvira, yeah, we already talked about her. Hannah Oiberg just sort of didn't show up this year, uh, raced all the, all the races, but just like was not that as competitive as I think most people thought she would be. And Julia Simone is standing on top of the podium. <laughs> it's uh, kind of it's kind of crazy because I still think that like the women's field is wide open. Even though she had a much better season this year, I still think the, the women's field is just wide open right now. Mm-hmm. I, I totally agree. I think next year it's, you know, anyone's game, and I think they know it too. I think if any of them have a, you know, a good, solid, consistent season the whole year, any of them could be in that yellow bib with that globe at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. But none of them except for Simone was able to do that this year. And, you know, hats off to her. It was awesome to watch her race all year and, you know, keep that fight alive throughout the whole season, but, you know, never really give up that yellow bib. And I think next year there's a lot of names that think that they're going to have a chance to win that overall globe. And we're just going to have to sit back and watch it all unfold. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, Simone really stepped it up too. I mean, throughout her entire career, she's been like a, maybe approximately an 80% shooter. Her prone and standing kind of fluctuates up and down. And then like even two years ago, she was a 75% shooter. Terrible. Then she brought it back up to 81%. Good for her. Then suddenly this year, out of nowhere, 88% shooting, including 93% in the prone and that's just like you went from being a below average shooter to borderline elite shooter in one season. Uh, so if I ever get the chance to talk to her, I want to figure out what the hell did she do in this summer to turn that up. But then she also picked up her skiing as well. I mean, like she was pretty competitive with the top 10 last year. And now this year she's faster than the top 10. Last year, she was about the same as like a, a top 15, top 20 skier. And this year she's well above the top 15 skier. So just all around, like no wonder 
I say nobody. I'm sure people in France probably wanted her to do well. But like, like no wonder I didn't see her coming this year because just from her stats, she didn't she did not stand out as a potential overall winner because she improved that much. And like it's not like she was on an upward trajectory and we we're like, oh, let's see if she continues this, you know, to the front of the field. It's like, no, no, she was kind of like plateauing there for a little bit couple seasons of consistent performance and then suddenly out of nowhere everything bumps up (laughs) Mm -hmm. and all of her like you said all of her metrics that are measured on realbiathlon.com are way up from last year and seeing that kind of improvement in one summer and one year is you know kind of crazy and if she continues to go up next year, I don't see like one of the other women is going to have to have a season like she did this year where every single metric goes up, especially if Simone improves again next year upon what she did this year. And I don't know if anyone's going to be able to take as big of a step as she did, but I'm really excited to watch the women's overall next year. Yeah. And I mean, we'll, we'll get into all the retirements in a minute, (laughs) but, um, no, I, 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 like I said, I just, I feel like the field is, is wide open. Um, okay. Here's a hypothetical for you. Obviously, absolutely no way we would have been able to compare this or do this, but let's say Daria Alambekova was still on the scene. Does she win the overall this year? That's a good question. I, I'm going to say no. Really? You think I don't Simone know is above? I, I do think so. I think, I mean, I don't know if, uh, I think Simone was just more consistent this year. You know, it, she was always right there. She, you know, she wasn't winning 19 of the races like Johannes Tengis Bo, but she was always in that top five you know, making the race close and keeping herself in the race with her shooting and her ski speed. I don't know if um, Alan Bekova could have could have done that throughout the whole year and in every race, every race format consistently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, last year, or the, I'm sorry, the last season that Alan Bekova competed, she was 88% shooting total. And uh, skiing against the top 10 back was about 1% back, about 5% back from from the, the top 30. So, yeah, I mean, even just based on raw stats, you would say that Simone was a little bit ahead this year. But, um, no, that will go down. And I'm sure people in Russia, I know that everyone's very controversial thing here that Belarus and Russia aren't competing. Um, but I think this will always, I don't want to say it's going to go down as like, oh, like, but Russia and Belarus weren't there because Simone earned this. I mean, she competed extremely well against extremely good athletes, but you know, if you're a, if you're a Belarus, a Belarus fan, it'll always wonder, you know, I wonder how Elian Bakava would have done against Julia Simone. But no, I don't want to take any way, I don't want to take anything away from Simone because she 100% earned this this victory. She did what she needed to do. She stepped up her ski speed, she stepped up her shooting, and like you said, she was consistent because consistency is king. Like I don't think I don't even know she uh, I think I had the stat written down somewhere here. Um, four people had four wins this year. And then another two people had three wins. And there was, and and Simone won because she was consistently on the podium with 12 podiums. And then Vitozzi had eight podiums. So like, yeah, you're right. She wasn't Johannes Tingus Bo, like destroying the field, but she was consistent. And that's what you need to do to win the overall. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to go back to your hypothetical situation, we might get to find out next year. But, you know, all credit to Simone. She had an amazing season. I remember back at the beginning of the season, we were wondering how 
how on earth she was in first because all of her metrics were slower than some of the other athletes. But she just made it happen every single race, every single weekend, and you know, all the credit to her for that. All right, here we go. We got a miss here, and uh, I don't know if you've been following this story at all, Ethan, but the French coaches, um, Vincent Vitoz, no relation to Lisa Vitoz, <laughs> different names, Vincent Vitoz and Patrick Favre, 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 I don't know, um, they quit unexpectedly. They announced that they'll be leaving the team after Holman Cole, which it is now after Holman Cole, so they're gone. Um, and it's not just that they quit unexpectedly, but they, in the media, they talked a little bit about how they felt like there was no connection with the athletes anymore. And that's the reason for leaving. And specifically they had uh, a quote, uh, this is five Favre, Favre, I don't know how to pronounce his name, probably some French accent. Uh, he said, Quote, they are already stars, even those who haven't won anything. Before making the star on the networks, it must be done on the track and on the shooting range. Some people think they're stars without doing anything, and it's hard to coach. This is something that did not exist in our time. We used to talk after winning, but now they talk before winning. So basically what he's referring to is, you know, biathlon's been exploding and booming so much in France that people are becoming stars when they're on the IBU cup or even on the junior cup, or even before they qualify for an IBU event, they're becoming popular and they're becoming famous through their social media presence. And so he's saying that they're um, the athletes are coming into the team sort of, I guess like with uh, the mentality that they've already done it, they've already earned it. They've already won it. And he wants hungry athletes. He wants the athletes who are fighting for the podium and want the podium. Um, and he just feels that disconnect there is is not it's not a place for him anymore. He just, you know, he wants he wants these athletes. There's a disconnect between what the athletes want and what he wants. And so for that reason, he and Vincent are are stepping down. Um, and I guess the reason why I think we should talk about this is because. There was no wins for the French men this year. And granted, Johannes Tinga's bow absolutely uh, hogged the podium this year. So it's kind of hard to say, you know, it was the French team's fault. But there was no wins this year for the French men. And that's the first since 1997. So you're going back past Forcade, past like Vincent J, and into the. Uh, Raphael Poré era <laughs> and That's... no wins. So I don't know. Is, do you think that the, uh, the French men's team should be worried? I, you know, it's hard to know what the athletes, you know, hard because we don't know both sides of this story, but I think I'm a little worried for them. I think we saw their performance drop this season and, Jacqueline struggled to stay consistent and stay, you know, competitive on the World Cup and we were all kind of waiting for him to, you know, take that next step and be fighting for the podium every race, but we just didn't quite see that this year. Uh Fion Maye was, you know, a good ways off his performance the past few seasons and I don't know. It it's not looking so great now without a coach and having not the best year and probably not the year they had imagined or had in mind that they could have but you know if if they're right the coaches and how they how the athletes are coming into the team with big heads big egos thinking that they deserve to win not wanting to put the effort in to win that's that's really hard to coach and you're probably not going to see much success with an attitude like that but you know, we don't really know both sides and I am a little worried for the French team just with what we do know. And we'll just have to see you know, what happens next year and who comes in to fill their spots. Cause there's a lot of good coaches in the biathlon world out there. Yeah. And I mean, so looking at the stats here, obviously we already said no wins since 97 total podiums 
for the men this year? Six. Six. They haven't been in single digits forever. I mean, as long as as far back as this data is going that I was able to find. Last year, 23 podiums for the men. Granted, they had they had uh Kantan Filmaya, who was the overall winner. 23 podiums last year. This year, six. Even the year before that, 18. 32, going back to the Fourcade era. 18 again, 28. Like these guys, the French team is getting accustomed to about 20 podiums a year. Good years are over 30. Bad years, closer to 15. Six this year. Top fives even, 16. In the past few seasons, you're looking at over 25. So, yeah, it's it was ugly. I mean, I think we all we were all talking about Quentin Filmaier. You know, he last year he was the the star. He uh, really had a strong season. He was the showman. Um, really good Olympics, uh, silvers in like I think every race or something. But yeah, like Filmaier dropped this year, and everyone's kind of like, where the heck is he? Um, Jacqueline was. He seemed like a roll of the dice this year. Seemed like he he just like it, it was a gamble every single race. <laughs> you which which Jacques Lon were you gonna get? The only real consistent person you had on the French team this year was Fabian Cloud, who had an incredible season. Like hats off to him. Like he really stepped up. Um but he's not he's not like your your number one guy who you're kind of like Oh yeah, Fabian's going to be fighting for the podium every race. He's not that kind of guy. He's like a really consistent like he's going to be your you know, maybe a podium every once in a while, but really consistent top 10 kind of guy. They were relying on him this year. And then you have an aging Giganot. You have a who else is even on the team? Uh <laughs> I, I don't even know after that. <laughs> I feel like I'm forgetting someone. But um I don't know, there's just like yeah, it was just ugly. Um, they're saying that you know the team is obsessed with you know the 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 fame, the stardom, the social media presence, and they just don't have that that hunger anymore. Um, I really hope they can turn it around. I mean, you get you have such a long period of time from the Raphael Poiré era through the Martin Fourcade era of just that one guy. Like, okay, you know, you can't unless you're Norway or France or Germany for the women, like you can't get used to having the best in the world on your team. You can't, that that's a luxury. Okay. So you can't expect the best in the world to be on your team. So you can't expect like, you know, one of these guys is going to be the best, but you need a, you need a leader. You need a front runner. You need someone who maybe could challenge for best in the world. Like, I think Sweden has that with Ponsaloma and Sim, uh, Samuelson. I think, um, and I think, unfortunately, Norway has like four of those guys. <laughs> um, but like, Cloud's just not that guy for me. So they need, desperately, they need Phil Maia to come back. They desperately need um, uh, Jacqueline to sort of straighten out a little bit and get his head on straight because he's just too much of a gamble and they need, they need to come back because you have this awesome opportunity that for cod has built. He's really built by in France. Like I don't want to take any, anything away from Raphael Pere because he did a lot to make France a team in biathlon, like a, a nation, but for cod's legacy in building French biathlon because Fourcade was a guy who also, he did a lot with the media. He did a lot like to build popularity for the sport. And now you have, you know, from top to bottom, from World Cup to Junior Cup, you have great athletes coming through the French system. And also at all their national events, there's like in- incredibly uh, competitive teams and scenes all over the nation. But you need like Forcad was able to do that and be talking to the media, but still be hungry and still want more and still like have that emotional awareness to get back and fight. 
And like, I think Jacqueline is just like, he's proven with his erratic nature this year that he's a little lost and like, maybe he's like, that's unique to him. And maybe he's more predisposed to having, you know, this issue, but like even, even Phil Maia, like, I don't know. I just, I don't know the guy, but it just seemed like he didn't, he wasn't doing as well this year and it just seemed like he didn't care. And I didn't like, I know that's, that's pretty uh, inflammatory to say, but there was never like, I never saw him look pissed that he was having a bad season. It always just looked like he crossed the finish line. And he was like, uh, it, you know, it, it's like, it's almost like he was like, um, like, a. In, in the U.S., we say like uh, uh, senior spring or like senioritis. You know, it's like you've already got accepted to college. You're basically just going through the motions now to get through the rest of your high school career. You're just kind of floating. Who cares? I don't care if I get bad grades, I'm like not doing homework. He just kind of seemed like, oh, pff, last year was the Olympics. Last year was, you know, I, that was the fight. And now I'm just coasting. I've already done it. I've already earned it. I'm just cruising now. Like I never saw that aggressiveness and that passion from him that you need to see from a guy uh, who's going to be your leader. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think? (laughs) I, I, I agree. I think we last year he achieved all the things that he, you know, set out to do and achieved a lot of the things you can achieve in biathlon and, you know, 99% of the biathletes in the world will never achieve what he did last year, or the year before. And it just seemed like he was, you know, kind of flat this year. Like there was that same desire to win and, you know, just let alone beat everyone else was just didn't seem like it was there. And maybe this issue with the athletes and coaches back and forth, some stuff happened throughout the year and, you know, there was more going on in his head than just racing and training. And hopefully they find good coaches and, you know, everything falls in place for them this summer and they have a great summer and come back and they have, you know, two to three guys that are competitive for podiums or top tens every single race. Cause it was, you know, at some points it was, you know, Norway was one through five or one through four in races and it was, it was fun to watch, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't totally as exciting as it could have been or as it has been in the past. And we were just missing that kind of like that polished finish and the polished races that we were used to seeing from Fion Maé and some of the other French athletes that we just didn't see this year. Mm-hmm. And I really hope that next year they can come back and have some good results and maybe finish a little higher in the overall, be a little more competitive in the relays. But I think they just need to, you know, move on, go their separate way, the coaches and the athletes and, you know, figure some, figure some stuff out and come back next year. Yeah. I mean, Phil Maia still finished eighth overall this year. Like, I mean, the last three seasons he's been fighting for the overall, like third, first last year, obviously, and then third, third, third. Um, so, I mean, he still, he didn't have a bad season. Like, I mean, if you take away last year and you just look at this year, you're like, oh yeah, another good season for Phil Maia. But given his, you know, success last year, this just seemed like a flop. Um, and I mean, the, the, the French men won gold in Oberhof for the men's relay. So it's not like they're capable, you know, they're, they, they upset Norway on the day that it counted. So they're capable. They have the ability. They have three, four strong guys that, you know, they can do it. I, you know, honestly, I think at their best, if everyone on the French team was at their best for the entire season, I think they're a better team than, than Norway. Like, like I think all of their guys at their best are better than Christensen and Tarje, who are getting a little bit on the older side. Um, yeah, I think I think they can be just as good as Norway, but they really got to fight for it. They they like you need to want it, and I think you're right. Maybe they get some new some new coaches in there, different perspective. I think change of perspective is always good. 
and yeah, maybe maybe French, the French are the ones to look out for next year. <laughs> mm-hmm. And they still finished second in the men's uh, Nations Cup points, which is you know better than I thought they would based on the season they had. But you now, like you said, hopefully they get you know a good situation this fall or this summer in terms of coaches and bounce back for next year. Yeah. All right, let's move on because we got a lot of stuff to talk about here. Next hit, uh, and it's kind of, it's it's like a pseudo hit. It's a hit because we're happy, but it's also kind of a miss because we're kind of sad. But there are so many retirements this year. And it just like, there was a couple days there where boom, 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 back to back to back, people were announcing their retirements and it was almost too, too much. <laughs> um, but okay, so we have... Denise Herman Vic, uh, who, you know, great, great season uh, this year. Marta Olsby Roisland, I think we all sort of expected it. She sort of announced after last year she's coming back for one more year. She got half a season, whatever. Anaya Chevalier Boucher, I did not see this one coming, but I'm not surprised. Tara Lakoff totally saw this one coming. Uh, no racing for her this year, uh, just mentally not in there. And then Mary Ader. Uh, announced her retirement the day right before uh, the last race. And again, another one where I'm like, I didn't see it coming, but I'm not surprised. She's getting up there a little bit. So um, yeah, you take these ladies out of the equation. You're taking away um, fourth place in the overall. uh, And then you're taking away Roisland, who was 15th, but literally raced half the season, but she could be a contender for the, for the podium. Um, You're taking away, uh, Ekhoff, another one who didn't race, could be a contender for the podium. Chevalier came in eighth this season. And then Mary Ader, 22nd, but one of the faster skiers, just like can never really get it together with the shooting. You're taking away some of the big names here in the overall. <laughs> That's really going to help Julia Simone, Doro, Lisa for next year. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And these are some of the fastest skiers True. on the World Cup too, which... You know, it's kind of crazy to think about when you look at the names. It's like if these, uh, how many names? One, two, three, four. If these five names were the fa- five fastest skiers for a race, I would not be surprised. I think <clears throat> the women's field is just going to look a little different next year. You know, some of those, you know, like huge Tyrrell Ekhoff ski times to help her win races and Roisland's ability to just like take over a race in the range. And Herman being able to just like pop off at any time and win any kind of race, you know, that's not going to be there. But I still think the women's field is going to be super exciting and interesting to watch next year, regardless of these athletes retiring. But it will be really sad to not see these athletes race again. And they all had amazing careers and achieved so much in the sport. But, you know, everyone's time comes to an end and. I think all of these athletes are leaving on good terms, except maybe Tira Lekhoff not racing this year, but I think it might be the right decision for her. And you know, she was one of my favorite athletes to, to watch in the women's field. And you know, sad we didn't get to see a race this year, but you know, all the best to them and what's more to come in life for them. Yeah. And, and so I just, I do want to go like a little bit specifically one by one into each of these athletes legacies um, just looking at Denise Herman right now, um, I mean, talk about legacy. Like you mentioned, one of the faster ski years, extremely strong, extremely consistent, like just year over year, just um, just continually improving her shooting, just that extra little bit, like 2% a year, but just that 2% each year just made it better and better for her. And, you know, she was sort of that first one who – crossed over from cross country to biathlon and it was kind of like oh how's she gonna do you know she was like stina nielsen and lamb pitch before it was cool and i mean talk about legacy she earned gold medal in cross country and biathlon she proved that you can do that um she's earned two gold medals in world championships for biathlon a slew of silvers a slew of bronze and then obviously uh, being on a German team, you know, couple relays as well. Um, 
but yeah, just like, I think Denise in terms of legacy, like, no, she's not going to go down as like a French or sorry, a German legend, you know? Yeah. She'll be the hero from this era, but she's not going to go down as a legend in the German, uh, in the German system. But what she will do is I think she will show every single Stina Nielsen, every single Lampich, every single whoever, um, Margie Freed, maybe <laughs> she will show every single cross country skier that you can be a biathlete. Like you can do it. And, you know, it took her, let's see, I'm just trying to see. It took her two seasons before she was shooting 80%, like 80%. Like that's, that is good. Like there our world cup team. There's some people on our world cup team who have been doing biathlon for much longer than two seasons who aren't even at 80% yet. And she immediately burst onto the scene as one of the faster skiers. And just, she continued that throughout pretty much her entire career was labeled as one of the faster skiers. So, um, yeah. And then she was, I mean, she won, she won a biathlon race, a sprint pursuit back to back in year number two of being a biathlete. So I don't know. I think it just shows that like good athletes are good. She's a disciplined person. She was able to learn the shooting right away, keep her skiing up. Like in terms of legacy, I think Denise is going to show that, you know, you can be successful. There is a way to be successful in biathlon if you're a fast cross country skier. Mm -hmm. No, I, I totally agree. I think she is a perfect example. You have to put in the work and you have to be able to understand that it's probably not going to go very well right away when you switch over as we've seen from, you know, Stina Nielsen and Lampich so far. But if you stick with it and keep putting in the hours, keep putting in the work, it will pay off and it will eventually turn around and you will see success. And she, you know, she won everything essentially except for an overall title. You know, she won some discipline globes. She got an Olympic gold, another Olympic medal, golds at world champs. Like you said, a ton of silvers. And that hard work really paid off. And that was super awesome to see. Cause like you said, she was the first one to really make this switch. And I remember thinking, oh, it's not going to work out. Like, you know, I can't believe the Germans are letting her do this, but she proved me and a lot of other people wrong that, you know, you can master the shooting if you put in the time and the effort. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll, we'll move on to Marta Olsby Roisland now. Um, <clears throat> didn't talk very much about her this year just because she, um, you know, didn't even race the first part of the season. She literally said, I'm here for world champs. And like, that's what she did. She showed up just in time to get some races under her belt and then raced well at world champs. <laughs> and, uh, then, uh, you know, took off Had two, two relay golds, a third in the pursuit. And then she won a world cup race, I think in, uh, in Nova Mesto or something like that. So like, definitely picked up right where she left off. Um, you know, I'm going to be honest, Marta, for me, like, I don't really remember her coming onto the scene. Um, I, you know, the last Norwegian I remember who was dominant was like Tora Berger. And then when she retired, I think maybe in 2016, after they had their, their home champs in Oslo, um, don't really recall Marta being that competitive, but just looking at her results year over year, just very slow, casual improvement year over year, especially in the overalls. And then suddenly she's just like fourth overall in 19, fifth overall in 2020, second overall in 21, and then wins the globe last year, has a immaculate season with uh, golds at the Olympics, uh, other medals at the Olympics. Honestly, she was, and I recall correctly, she was like, everyone was like looking at, oh, could it be, um, could it be uh, Quentin Fiomaier? Is he going to be the golden guy of the Olympics? And then, no, it's going to be Marta Olsby Roisland. And then, oh no, the team, the relay team comes up flat in the relay and Johannes Tingus Bo sweeps in with a golden relay and, and becomes like the golden guy of the Olympics, but um, the golden person. But, you know, Marta, like she cleaned up in uh, in Anholtz World Championships in 2020 with golds in every single event except for the the pursuit in the individual where she earned bronze. So like her ability to to just 
turn it on when it counts. I mean, she has so many medals from world championships. It's crazy. And then with only two Olympic performances, but, but seven medals in two Olympics, just she, she's a perfect example of someone who can just turn it on when it counts. <laughs> mm-hmm. And also another example of proving that hard work over year after year after year pays off because it took her six years until she was broken into the top 10 of the overall, which is, you know, a lot longer than some of the other better athletes on the world cup. And you know, she was never like you said, that huge star of the Norwegian team for so many years, but she was always consistent. She was always someone they could count on in relays. She would always have exceptional shooting throughout the course of the seasons. And, you know, she also proved that you don't have to be, you know, the fastest skier to win races. You can shoot your way into having a great season too. Mm -hmm. I mean, speaking of consistency, let's, let's jump over to someone who wasn't necessarily the most consistent throughout her whole career, but definitely was a fan favorite, Tara Lykoff. We didn't see her this year just because of mental health issues. I don't know what, what was going on there. I, I think what happened was Tyrrell is obviously an incredibly like social person. She loves, um, I don't want to say the attention, but I think she just loves people. She's very like happy. She's very fun. And I think the year of COVID, the, the requirements uh, whether imposed by the Norwegian Biathlon Federation or the IBU, were just so strict on her that I think she lost she lost her favorite part of this whole biathlon lifestyle, which was the social aspect. That biath- biathlon became very hard for her mentally. You know, you're stuck in your room. You can't interact with anyone because of COVID. You get to come out for training and racing, and that's it. And I mean, her her performance improved drastically that year of 2020. Um, you know, maybe because of because of the the requirement to focus and and uh, you know bring it all together. I mean, she she was she wasn't even in the top 10 overall, and then suddenly comes in second overall, and then follows it up with winning the overall in 2021. So. Um, and from what I recall for the longest time, she was always a fan favorite, always cheering for her, but she just like could never pull it together. So I think maybe, yeah, having that, that forced focus with COVID, um, was what, what pushed her over the hump in terms of performance. But I think mentally it just destroyed her. And I think it just, it was hard and she lost maybe a little bit of that love for the sport. And then you know, it's tough, like as an athlete, if you're, if you're a biathlete and your job day in and day out is to go to training, work hard, go to races, you know, live on the road, live away from your family, like your identity is as a biathlete. And then suddenly there's a slight, like, I don't enjoy this anymore. Even if it's 5%, 10%, like a very subtle, just, I don't know if I truly enjoy this anymore. It's a it's an identity crisis and I'm not her therapist. I'm not her, you know, (laughs) she doesn't confide in me with how things are going, but this is just, this is just how I read it. I think there was just a very slight, like, this is my identity, but I don't know if I want this to be my identity anymore and probably caused a lot of mental pain for her. Um, And so I really hope that she finds something that she loves. And I, I hope she can find, you know, the new Terrell now after her, after her retirement, we definitely missed her this year. I think she's probably aside from Doro might be the, the biggest fan favorite out there. Um, so it's just really hard to see her not compete this year. Cause I think we all wanted her to, especially, you know, after the success she had at the Olympics last year, bringing home a couple more medals um, great world championships in Polk Luca. So, you know, I just, I just hope I wish her the best. I mean, obviously I wish everyone the best who retires and is no longer doing biathlon anymore, but like, I, I really hope that she's able to find, um, you know, find a new path for herself, whether it's as a coach or has nothing to do with biathlon. 
yeah, I, I totally agree. I think she was one of the uh, consistently more exciting athletes to watch in the World Cup. You know, she either had an amazing race or the wheels fell off a little bit. But it was really sad not watching her be on the World Cup and race this year. Um, she had an amazing career that 2021 that 2020 2021 season will you know will be in the back of our heads for a long long time especially her world champs performance in uh Pukyuka. but you know that mental aspect of the sport is one that we can't measure we'll never know where she was at compared to other athletes or really where anyone is at but in a sport like biathlon and cross-country skiing if that side of the of you know who you are as an athlete is struggling or not up to the same level as the other aspects of you then you know it's really hard to have success because you're just not enjoying it and it's just not you know going your way and being able to push yourself to the absolute limit is just not possible and it's just not it's also just not healthy and if for her not competing this year was the right decision for her to be healthy and happy, then I think she made the right choice 100%. But, you know, it happens. And that's just how life and how the sport goes. But, yeah, you know, congratulations on a great career for her and all the best in whatever comes next. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Just congratulations on a great career. She was a great athlete. Fans loved her. And I think she'll always go down as, as a fan favorite, period. Then we got uh, Anaya Chevalier, who I did not, uh, like I said, I you know didn't expect her to retire, but I'm not surprised. 30 years old, she's got the kid. Um, she took a baby break a couple of years ago, came back um, just as competitive, if not more competitive, um, when she took off because she took off in you know the at the end of the 2019 season, no racing 2020, and then came back for you know 21 or sorry 2021 season. And her skiing was just best she's ever had. Um, Before leaving, she was, you know, a little bit below average. And then when she came back, she was ahead of the average skier. Her shooting has always been relatively strong. And it's funny, actually, she, she lost a little bit that season when she came back after the baby break. She, before the baby break, she was 86% shooter, which is pretty good. And then when she came back, she was an 80% shooter, but she was able to bring it back these last two seasons back up to 85%. Um, with her newfound ski speed, it also improved uh, her performance year over year. She, uh, she, she hasn't had a win since 2017, so she was never atop of the podium. I think she's got one win in her career. Yep, one win. But 23 podiums, uh, very consistent. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, she was never my favorite. She was never one that I was like, oh, yeah, she's going to be fighting for the win today. She's going to be fighting for a podium. Um, but she was always in there. She was always just like a consistent, safe, like, yeah, she's going to have a good result today probably. Or if uh, even in the relay, you know, you always felt very confident if she got handed off to in a relay, anchoring the, the French women's team. Always felt super confident in Anaya Chevalier Boucher. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know she had a you know a good career. She was competitive enough to even make most of the mixed relays and have success success in there with the French team as well. And I think what stood out to me about her, like you said, was just her reliance in the relays. She was always someone that the French team could count on. And you know, never really, you know, disappointed or had a bad race, if you know what I mean. And yeah, I don't know she was just super solid and you know, a good, a good French biathlete. Yeah, and unfortunately, even though she only has one win in her career, which is like nine, like you said, ninety percent of athletes will probably never get a win. Um, but she has three, or sorry, two medals from the Olympics in, um, one of them being in the individual. So that's a, that's a, a personal medal. And then, uh, she has, sorry, two medals, so three total medals, two medals, uh, in relay events. So she's got three Olympic medals to her name. She's got seven world championship medals, which is crazy when you think that 
she's only got a few, <laughs> she's only got 23 podiums in her career and 10 of those 23 come from a major championship. So definitely someone who has stepped up uh, when the, when it counts. So yeah, Anaya Chevalier. And I think she's also been like, she's been a good mentor. Her, her younger sister, Chloe, is on the team now. She's starting to become a more regular uh, team member for the World Cup team. The French women have a lot of young athletes coming through, like Sophie Chauveau, Lou Jaminel. So she's she and even uh, Julia Simone, they've kind of been this like mentorship uh, style um, figure on the team. And even when I talked to Lou Jaminot this year, uh, this summer, uh, and asked her, you know, about the, what it's like to be an athlete in the French system, she even mentioned that like mentorship and older athletes taking you under their wing is like a part of their culture. And she didn't, she didn't necessarily, um, she didn't like say Anaya Chevalier specifically, but she said that the mentorship is part of their culture. And I have always kind of like, without really knowing much about Anais or their system, I've always had this idea in the back of my mind that she is sort of like a mentor to the younger ones. Maybe I'm just thinking that because she's a mom and, you know, she seems very motherly to me. I don't know, (laughs) but um, I don't know. I just think like she's, she's maybe passing the torch to Julia Simone a little bit now because we had Anais Bescon retire last year and nice Chevalier Boucher retires this year. Next year, Julia Simone will be about 30 years old. Um, you know, and you got this really strong young, uh, women's team coming through. So hopefully she can stay involved in biathlon a little bit. Maybe she can share some of her wisdom, uh, with all her, her races or all her seasons on the world cup. Um, but yeah, best of luck for, uh, best of luck for the rest of her life. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then finally we have mary ader who again another one who i was like kind of surprised to see she's announcing her retirement but i'm not surprised at the same time this is just someone who unfortunately just i feel like had a ton of potential but just could not could not bring it together on the range really fast skier sometimes she's even posting the fastest ski time of the day amongst um you know amongst uh uh, Herman and Elvira Oiberg. No, it's, it's, uh, Mary Ader, but her shooting percentage was just not good enough. Um, career. Uh, so this year she was 75% shooter. Her career shooting was 74%. That's like 10% off where you needed to be. If she could have, you know, if she can just get one more hit every race would have made a huge difference in her career performance. But, um, it's too bad. Cause I, I, I really wanted to see, if she could have a season that was like as good as Chevalier Boucher or as good as um, trying to think of someone else, like who's on that cusp, you know, Um, but you know, we never, we never really got to see it. Her best. I mean, she saved her best for last, her best season this year. She finished 22nd overall, but you know, I, I would have loved to see a season where she finishes 10th overall and is consistently fighting. Um, yeah, consistently fighting for a top 10 or even a flower ceremony. Mm -hmm. And she was on the world cup for a long time. Yeah. Uh, To be, to be honest, almost as long as I have been alive, but um, she's 35 years old. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) But she, no, like you said, always super fast on the skis and, at least in the first half of races, she was always kind of in it, and you're always wondering, kind of waiting for her to you know, take that step and have a little more success than what she has typically shown. But you know, she had a long career on the Finnish team and had some great races in there mixed in, but we were always wanting a little bit more on the range. Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, there's going to be a little bit of a hole in the system now because Macarinen retired a couple of years ago. Um, Ada retiring now. I don't really see a superstar coming up through the Finnish system. Um, but uh, I think they have uh, they got some guys who are competitive, so maybe they can um, kind of fill the hole, fill that Finnish appetite for biathlon success. <laughs> 
but no, uh, good season or good career for Mary Ader as well. Um, unfortunately, let's see. I mean, she, she did win two races in her career again, much more. That's more than, uh, than an I Chevalier can say. So, um, it's kind of, yeah, kind of funny to, to think that she has two wins. And I think those two wins came a couple seasons ago back in 2016, 17. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a solid career. All right, let's move on to our next shot. Speaking of, um, I mean, we're talking about athletes who are retiring. Let's talk about the fight for the blue bib because this is kind of like looking towards the future now. You know, we, we reminisced a little bit on, you know, what was. Let's talk about what is going to be. Um, blue bib, super exciting battle. If you weren't paying attention uh, in the background, there was a good battle going on between Gia Kamel, Hartvig, uh, Philip Anderson. Unfortunately, Anderson uh, kind of bowed out a little bit with his COVID and then uh, just really couldn't come back. Um, I think he had actually ended up even going to the IBU Cup and just kind of finished the season out there. So the battle came down to Hartvig and Gia Kamel. And like both of them are exciting for very different reasons. But Gia Kamel had the blue bib going into the last race. And out of nowhere, Hartvig finishing the season with a second place uh, steals the bid back from Gia Kamel. And Tommaso was very uh, professional about it on Instagram. He posted a picture of the two of them hugging at the finish line and said, good battle. I'm coming for you next year. And so, um, you know, it's just, it's just the blue bib. It's, you know, obviously it's not that ex- it's not like make or break. Um, but the fact that the IBU does highlight it by having a specific bib for it gives it a little bit of excitement. Um, but we got a good, uh, exciting fight of youngsters uh, coming through the the system right now. And uh, I think this is going to be a fun fight for the next couple of seasons. What do you think? I I totally agree. I think in terms of uh, Giacomo and Hartvig, they Hartvig still has one more year under 25. So we'll get to see them battle out again. And I think uh, Philip Field Anderson has a few more years as well. So seeing the three of them kind of fight it out for that blue bib is going to be you know, super exciting. I think uh, Anderson might be at a little bit of a disadvantage as he is Norwegian and probably will not get as many starts and opportunities as the other two. But I think he's definitely, when he races and is healthy, super competitive with the other two of those guys. And I'm excited to watch them, you know, fight it out all of next year. I think they each have, you know, they each find their success in different ways, which is what makes it so exciting. And, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. And I mean, these guys, Hartvig and Gio Kamel, they also finished 11th and 12th overall. So these guys are already fighting at the front of the field. Um, Hartvig, obviously, two two podiums this year. Swiss guy, out of nowhere, two podiums. Like, I remember when Benny Vager was the only thing the Swiss had going for them. And he was, you know, lucky to get the top 10. And suddenly, Hartvig, two podiums. Gio Kamel, I don't think he had um any podiums this year maybe you can fact check me on that but either way um but either way like anderson he was he was ahead of these guys in the blue bib uh fight and then with the covid he had to bail out bow out a little bit but you could have expected him to finish in the top 10 probably um you know because he's been competitive with tarie and christiansen all year um and then Look who comes in actually, who really actually came in third in the overall was Sebastian Stadler. Again, a Swiss guy. Where did these Swiss guys come from? And then uh, in fifth in the overall for the blue bib was Eric Perot, who I think personally, this is going to be the guy to look out for. Um, this guy, Perot, is super strong, super fast. And, you know, the French team, like we already talked about them, the French men are looking for that number four guy that they need to battle the the Norwegians more consistently. Maybe Perot is the guy who come, who comes in and is like, head down, I'm going to earn it. I'm going to fight for it. And he's the future for French, French biathlon. I don't know. But um, I mean, on the men's side, there's some, there's some big names coming through the, the, uh, the system. And I mean, you also got, you know, Campbell Wright, who's a U25 
Um, he's still a junior next year. Adam Runnels had a really solid season this year. Uh, Stravecki from Czech Republic had a good season this year. Banaz from uh, from Italy. These are the future stars, and they're already making splashes, <laughs> so to speak. Mm-hmm. To go back to the uh, Giacomo podium, he did have a podium. He was second in the individual in uh, Ostersund. And some of those names you just rattled off there are on this list too. Uh, Perot was sixth, showing that he can be competitive with the best in the world. And, you know, granted, Ligrid, Johannes Singesbo, and some of the other athletes weren't there at this race, but still, a top six and a second at a World Cup, no matter who's there, is, you know, nothing to, you know, shove to the side. Like, that's amazing and awesome. And it'll be. It'll be a more competitive battle than the men's overall for sure next year, in my opinion. But, you know, still super exciting. And I'm really glad the IBU, you know, put this, you know, not necessarily a smaller competition in there, but one that's a little more fun and kind of puts some athletes on the radar for everyone else to, you know, to be watching out for. Yeah. And on the women's side, it's a little bit different. Elvira Oiberg. Um, she won pretty easily this year, had a commanding lead, even though, even with like very little points towards the end of the year, she still won it. But Lou Jamino and Sophie Chaveau, two, two ladies who were fighting for the, for the overall, uh, for the IBU cup last year, um, first year on the world cup and Lou Jamino had a great season. I think she ended up finishing like, I want to say, uh, 10th or 11th overall, really good. And that, you know, that's competitive with Lisa Hauser, you know, just a couple of points behind Lisa, Teresa Hauser. Um, and then, you know, uh, Ama Baserga from Switzerland, Switzerland, all of a sudden, um, Amy Baserga, who had a great junior career. I think a lot of people are going to be looking for her in the next couple of years. And then we obviously have Passler and Auchenteller, the, the, the project, <laughs> the, uh, the project, uh, Olympics in Italy, uh, what's what's that that uh, world or what's that Olympic is going to be called? Uh, uh, Cortina. Cortina. Yeah, the Project Cortina team that's coming through for Italy right now. Um, yeah, I think I think the future is going to be exciting. I mean, we're going to have retirements. Everyone who retired this year that we just talked about, they're all in their thirties. Johannes Bo is going to be thirty next year. Granted, I think sometimes the men stick around a little bit longer than the women, but. Um, you know, some of our favorites, they're going to be getting old. And, you know, unfortunately, retirement is inevitable. And so we're going to have some of these names. They're going to be the ones that we're going to be talking about quite a bit for the next couple of years. So, um, yeah, I just hope that my I'm, I'm a big believer in like big data and the data. If, if there's an anomaly, like, for example, Hartvig this year, you could say his season was an anomaly. His hit rate skyrocketed. 13%. His skiing skyrocketed like 2%. So you could say that, oh, he's just, you know, this is just a really good season for him. He's going to go back down to where he normally is. But I think I, I really want them to be, you know, this is where they are. I want them to be competitive. I love seeing the youngsters competitive with the more established, the veterans. Um, the underdog, you know, I love that, that sort of mentality of seeing someone with fight come in and just, yeah, just, just shake it up a little bit, you know? (laughs) All right. Last hit here. How did your predictions go this year, man? How did, how did fantasy go? How did your predictor challenge go? Like this is, this is really, this is our review uh, for the, mm-hmm. the fans, the listeners of the podcast, do we know what we're talking about here, or are we just like, uh, are we just uh, you know off our rocker a little bit? I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, um, I think it went pretty well. I in terms of my fantasy team, I picked Johannes Singus Bo because that was you know, a free win almost every race. <laughs> uh, Ponsaloma, who I thought would. You know, turn it around on the range, which he you know, sometimes did. So it was, you know, hit or miss. And then I started the season off with uh, Sean Doherty on my team as well, and that didn't quite p- 
pan out. And so I added Hartweg, which, you know, pretty early in the season when he had success, I guess, relatively early on. And he was pretty consistent throughout the season. And then in terms of the women's side, I don't want to toot my own horn here, but I kind of crushed it on the women's side. Oh, yeah. With uh, Simone Vitozzi and Denise Hermanvik, mm. which are three of the top four overall on the World Cup mm. for the uh, women's side. And But I think I like to say that you and I know our stuff, and we might not know it the best of anyone out there, but you know we're no we're no bum sitting on the couch. No, and I mean okay. So in uh, in the biathlon pool um, fantasy game, I took a different approach. I went with the I'm going to try to pick a new team for every competition and see if I can get good points that way. You know, because I think some people will do better in specific races. So. I tried to be very uh, hands-on with my team picks, and you ultimately ended up beating me by about a thousand points. Um, I had ten thousand, and, and you had eleven thousand. So um, we were we were close. We were close, and there was there was like one point in the season where we were like literally right next to each other. <laughs> we had about the same points. You, me, and my dad actually, because my dad kept telling me he wanted to beat us. And so, um, yeah, we. Uh, I, I changed things up. You know, I was trying to follow trends. Who's hot right now? Who's cold right now? I, ch- I changed things up a bit. But, you know, still still finished in the top 50 out of uh, 150 or so people. I do have to say, though, uh, when I was in Kazakhstan, I was just so my – this is an excuse, but my schedule was just so busy that I didn't have a chance to update my team as regularly. So I was kind of stuck with whoever I kind of had on my roster. And, I mean, they were good athletes. I still had – you know, Bo on my team, obviously, that's like a guaranteed win. You need that one. But there was a couple of races there where I was not uh, updating. And I was, well, for example, I left Bo on my team when he was out for COVID. So that was not a good pick. That was not a good strategy. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it uh, it was fun. I really enjoyed this, this Python pool game. Um, I've been talking to the creator of the game, Eric. He uh, was very open to my feedback as to how we could make the game better next year. So, um, yeah, come on back next year and let's play again. Maybe we'll get some more on the line, more more bibs, more prizes. Could be really fun. Um, and then, yeah, for the uh, predictor challenge, I I like to pride myself in saying that I had a better score than Makarainen and uh, the TV expert there. Um, what's that guy's name? From oh, uh, oh Sven Fisher, yeah, I had more points than Macarinen and Sven Fisher, but Bjorn Dahlen he beat me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and then also the the Brian Halligan subscriber community on the Predictor Challenge was uh, we did pretty well. Our our we were led by this guy named Chris F. I don't know who he is, but he ended up coming in third overall out of everyone, and he was in our community, so he helped us uh, come in come in 84th out of a lot of teams. So thank you to all the people who joined the community and helped us helped us in the IBU Predictor Challenge. All right, spare round. We're almost done here, folks. I know it's been a long one. This will probably just stay as one episode. Spare mm-hmm. round. Who wins the overall next season, Ethan? Way too early. Who wins it? <laughs> I <laughs> I know it's early, but I think Johannes Singus Bo is a pretty good bet on the men's side. And then on the women's side, this this is a lot tougher than the men's side, in my opinion. But I'm gonna go with Lisa Vitozzi. Ooh, interesting. Just because she's shown that she can do it. She was super She's well competitive most of this year, and this year was a huge improvement from last year. And hopefully, she only keeps going up and has a great year next year. Yeah, we didn't even talk about her that much, but she had a great season. She came back. Mm. I mean, she she was another one that just sort of lost her way after coming in what second a couple of years ago like literally it came down to the last race and she just kind of <clears throat> had a terrible shooting day mm-hmm. screwed herself over doro ended up getting the victory and the globe but since then 
for like two seasons. She couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. And then suddenly this year it came back and comes in second again. So honestly, that's not a bad pick. I like that pick. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm a little jealous of that pick. All right. <laughs> for me, overall winner next year, I'm going Sterla Home Ligrid. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And I, it almost pains me to say this because those of you who have been following me and listening to my content for a long time know that I, for some reason, I'm just not a Ligrid fan. Um, I don't, I don't not like him. He's just not my favorite. I don't know why, mm. <laughs> but he's just not. But yeah. I think he's going to win next year. And I tell you why. I think Bo is going to pull a, a Marta Olsby Roislin. He's got the kid at home. Um, he bailed at the Olympics last year because he had such a successful season. He's like, I'm going home to be with the family. Um, I think family stuff is going to come up, whether he has another kid, whether he has COVID, something's going to come up where he's going to bail. Ligrid is just so consistent. He's so strong. He earned more points than Julius Simone earned this year, which is crazy to think about. He came in second place and he earned more points than Julius Simone. I think he's going to, something's going to happen with Bo next year. I think when Bo is racing, he's going to clean up, but I don't think he's going to have that consistent attendance that you need. And Ligrid's got it. He's proven it the last two seasons. So I think he's in. And then for the women, oh man, this, it's this tough. could be, yeah, I, the Vitozzi is a great pick. I, I really want someone to come from like behind, but I don't, know if anyone's consistent enough i'm I'm gonna go i'm gonna go elvira oberg i think there's a lot of pressure on her this year to to be that person be that winner um obviously she was out a little bit with the covid the vid um but in terms of her performance this year she actually shot way better this year than she did last year skiing went down a little bit but I think it's. I think we were just one year early on Elvira mm-hmm. Oberg, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But you know, I, we'll see. I like that. I like that pick. She was second most of this year and was oh so close to putting that yellow bib on. But maybe it wasn't. It was just wasn't meant to be. And next year will be the year. Yeah, and I mean, so this will be. This is her fourth season. Next year will be her fifth season, but it'll be her fourth. I mean, she was twelfth in twenty twenty one. 12th overall and then second last year fifth this year so maybe like one more season of being competitive with the top athletes will be what she needs to get over that hump and officially you know win this dang thing (laughs) Mm -hmm. all right there it is we can come back next year in exactly 365 days and say we told you so (laughs) um but you know real quick I want to thank uh, you know everyone for listening to this ep- for this podcast, this episode, but also this podcast. I know this is a longer one, so if you've made it this far, we really appreciate you. Um, and if you could just you know leave us a review on any of your podcast listening platforms. I know we haven't asked you to do this or you know anything like that yet, but if you enjoyed this, if you could leave us a review, um, give us some five stars, and uh, we'd really appreciate it. But Thank you for being a loyal listener. Ethan, this was our best season yet. Every year, it seems like we get more and more episodes out there. So maybe next year, I mean, I'm a little torn because the reason I we didn't get all the, the episodes out this year was because I was on the road. So I hope next year we can get more. But if I'm on the road, then that means I'm doing personally well and we can't get you know what I'm saying? Or yeah. maybe next year you're going to be on the road and we can't get seasons or set sure. episodes out there. So who knows? Um, <laughs> it's it's not that we're being lazy. It's just that we're on the road a lot and we have other biathlon and cross country things going on in our lives. So we do our best to to meet when we can around our busy schedules and get this episodes out here because we truly love it. And Ethan, mm-hmm. I really appreciate you for being so um, flexible with scheduling, uh, being so just available and passionate when you, we are available to talk and passionate about biathlon. I appreciate you following the races because that was the one thing Like some people ask me, like, how did you and Ethan get, you know, to this podcast started? And I always tell them, 
I always wanted to have a, po- a podcast about biathlon, but I needed a co-host who was as dedicated to watching the races as I was. And so I told you from day one, all I ask of you is to just follow the races intently. And you've done that. So I really appreciate you. And, uh, you know, thank you for being a great co-host. Of course. I, I love doing this and I love biathlon. It's always fun to you know get on here and talk about what we think. And hopefully next year we have another great year and we you know, take it another step farther and, you know, keep improving, getting better at you know something we love doing. Yeah, that's right. That's all. It's, it's what it's about. Just keep improving. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. all right. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, mom and dad. Thank you, Academy. Thank you, wife. Uh, <laughs> no. All right. We will see you all next year. Unless who knows, maybe some random episodes will pop up in the middle of the summer. The only way for you to know is for you to subscribe. So until next year, we'll see you.